said it before, this is my song. I guess you could call it my anthem. And the choir is going to help me with it here this evening. for the reading of God's word in Psalms chapter 119 Psalm chapter 119 and I will be reading verse 11 Psalm 119 verse 11 this has been our theme verse for our Sunday night study on route 66 the psalmist is speaking he says thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin 
against thee. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that your word will lead us, your word will guide us, your word will strengthen us, Lord, when we cannot uh, depend upon ourselves, Lord, we can always depend upon you, for you are the way, you are the truth, you are the life. And Father, I pray that tonight you will speak to us through your word, that our lives may be changed forever by the power of your spirit, and we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. For over 11 or 12 weeks, we have been on our journey going down Route 66 as we're looking at the 66 books of the Word of God. Tonight, we're going to be concluding the Old Testament books, and so far in the books of the Old Testament, we have looked at the books of the Torah. This is also known as the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And from there, we went into the historical books of the Old Testament, such as the books of Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and the book of Esther. After that, we went into the poetic books. These are also known as the books of wisdom. There are five books. It is the book of Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and the Song of Songs, or also known as the Song of Solomon. Next, we covered the books of the major prophets. That is the book of Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, um, Ezekiel, and the book of Daniel. A few weeks ago, we began looking at the books of the minor prophets, and so far, we've talked about five of them, the book of Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, and the book of Jonah. And on our journey so far, as we've gone throughout the Old Testament, we've seen the mountaintops of God's call to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. We've seen the showdown between David and Goliath in 1 Samuel chapter 17. We've studied about Isaiah's description of Mount Calvary and the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as he wrote about it 600 years prior to its happening in Isaiah chapter 53. A few weeks ago, we looked at Jonah's ministry in the city of Nineveh, in which this entire city repented before God, and God brought about a great revival in that city. Tonight, we're going to conclude the final seven books of the minor prophets, in the, and also concluding the Old Testament. We're going to look briefly at six books, but spend most of our time on the book of Zechariah. A lot of the prophecies that we're looking at tonight are events that I firmly believe will take place soon and more than likely will take place in the immediate future in our lifetime. The first book I want us to look at tonight is the book of Micah. We know that Micah came from a village uh, 20 miles southwest of Jerusalem at a place called Morasheth Gath. His ministry took place known as the Southern Kingdom of Judah. It was around the year 740 B.C. Micah was quite possibly a friend of Isaiah, and his small book indicates that he was influenced by Isaiah. The theme of the book of Micah, although terrific judgment was coming upon the people of the Jewish people, Micah was foreseeing the glorious day in the future in which Israel was going to be redeemed and blessed by God as well as used by God to bring about the, uh, the plan of God. The first three chapters of the book of Micah talk about the judgment years while the last four talk about the comfort of God. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18, the Bible says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in his mercy. I don't know about you, but to me, this sounds like the gospel message. It's the message that we preach, the gospel message that there is no other God that saves. There's no other God that heals. There's no other God that can bring deliverance of sin, for there's only one God. There's only one Lord. There's only one faith. And Jesus has already said that no man can come to the Father except through him, that he is the way, that he is the truth, and he is the life. The prophecies of Micah, he, he even brought fear to King Herod the Great years later. 
700 years after the prophecies of Micah were written, the Bible tells us that there were some wise men that were making their way from current day Iraq westward to Judea. They had seen a bright star and, and they believed that perhaps a great future king had been born. And they made their way across the, the sands of the wilderness until they came to the city of Jerusalem. They immediately came to the king's palace. They thought, where else would a new king be born? In Matthew chapter 2, verse 1 through 6, the Bible says, Now when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they say unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judea, or of Judah, for out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. When Jesus was born in the city of Bethlehem, the prophecy of Micah had been fulfilled. In Micah chapter 6, verse 2, But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, Yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. The book of Micah closes with a short prophetic message, with an eternal glorious truth. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18 through 19, he says, Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity, and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities, and thou will cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. That goes to tell us, church, that sin will not last forever. There is coming a time when sin is going to cease to exist. Jesus Christ is going to come. There's going to be a millennial reign. All the things of this world is going to pass away, but his word will endure forever. He will reign victoriously forever as king of kings and Lord of lords, all sin and iniquity and sickness, everything that comes against the child of God, it will all be subdued. It will be put under the power of God himself. Satan will be destroyed forevermore, and the king of kings will reign, and we will be with him, worshiping him throughout eternity. Have you ever wondered why is it God shows humanity such great mercy? Is it because people are amazing? Is it because people are so wonderful? Absolutely not. It's quite the opposite. We did not do a thing to deserve his grace and his mercy. But it's because of his mercy. It's because of his love. It's because he is truly wonderful that he gave us the opportunity to come to know him through the Son, Jesus Christ. I want us to move on now to the book of Nahum. We know very little about Nahum except for the fact that he was born in Galilee. He prophesied against the city of Nineveh. In Nahum chapter 1 verse 1, it says that the burden of Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum, the Elkishite. So there were two things about Nahum that I think are of great interest. First of all, Nahum lived during the days of the Judean king Manasseh, who reigned for 55 years. More than likely, this was the king that had sentenced Isaiah to death by stuffing his body alive in a hollow log and then sawing him in half. Also, he lived 150 years after the ministry of Jonah in Nineveh, which was then the capital of Assyria where a great revival broke out. Now, I always love to see what happens after revival because you can always tell the, the genuine results and effects of a revival in the days, weeks, months, and years after the revival takes place. But unfortunately, in the city of Nineveh, although they had turned back to God, they had repented, this revival did not last because history records that the Assyrian Empire again began to grow vicious and cruel. 
The Ninevites had boasted that space was failing them for corpses of their enemies, and the people were making small pyramids of human heads to adorn some of their city streets. In other places of the city, pillars were covered with flayed skins of their rivals, and there was a, a stone pillar that was found some time ago by an archaeologist that was written by an Assyrian ruler. He was boasting of the nobles that he had flayed. He said, 3,000 captives I have burned with fire. I left not one hostage alive. I cut off the hands and feet of some. I cut off the noses, ears, and fingers of others. The eyes of numerous soldiers I put out. Maidens I burned as a holocaust. And when I look at that and I see the history of what is taking place in that region of the world, is it no wonder that today the Muslim terrorists who occupy that same land 2,500 years later are so brutal and so ungodly and so pagan in the way they live their life. 100 years after the writings of Nahum, Nineveh fell to the Persians. You see, the destruction of the city, the city of Nineveh that was so great and so ferocious but yet became so sensual it was so destroyed, and the, the, the evidence of that city was completely wiped away that years later, when Alexander the Great marched through, he had no idea that there was the remnants of a city beneath his feet. You see, there is no limit to God's patience. God will only put up with sin for so long until he finally turns them over to a reprobate mind. I believe we're heading at a time in this generation in which God has had just about enough of people's behavior. The United States has aborted too many unborn babies. We have endorsed perversion for too long and just called it an alternative lifestyle. We have endorsed all of the, the homosexual marriage and the same-sex marriage and, and, and giving equal benefits to everybody. And then we have a new Supreme Court justice that cannot tell you the difference between a male and a female, but yet she's supposed to be a very intelligent and educated woman. I beg to disagree. But we need to understand sin will not rule. God will put an end to it. God will bring about his judgment and his will will be accomplished. I want us to move on now to the book of Habakkuk. In the year 605 B.C., the Assyrians with the city of Nineveh as its capital was crushed by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. It was during this time that the prophet Habakkuk was living. In his own country of Judah, the southern kingdom, the people were ruled by one lousy king after another. Josiah was the last decent one. And then after King Josiah came King Jehoahaz and King uh, Jehoiakim and King Jehoashan and, and Zedekiah. All of these were leading to the final collapse of Judah and its capital city, Jerusalem, at the hands of the Babylonians. So Habakkuk's question in the short book was this, where is God? And why is he allowing all of this evil to take place? Have you ever heard someone ask that question? If God is really there, why is he allowing all of this evil to take place? Why, if God is so loving, why is he allowing this to take place? Even God's own prophet, Habakkuk, asked the very same question. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 2 through 4, he said, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And thou will not hear, even cry out unto thee of violence, and thou will not save. Why dost thou show me iniquity, and cause me to behold grievance? For spoiling and violence are before me, and there are they that rise up, raise up strife and contention. Therefore the law is slacked, and judgment doth never go forth. For the wicked doth come pass about the righteous, therefore wrong judgment proceedeth. Habakkuk was outraged to God's seeming indifference. Yet by the time this third chapter ends, he's worshiping God. Habakkuk assumed that God was not going to do anything, but in reality, God was working in behind the scenes. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 5, I'll read this from the New Living Translation. The Lord replied, look around at the nations. Look and be amazed, for I am doing something in your own day, something you wouldn't believe even if someone told you about it. I mentioned to you this morning when the disciples were out on the boat on the Sea of Galilee, 
They were facing that storm, and the storm was so intense, and they were so distracted by the things that were going on around them that even when Jesus was right there in front of them, they did not even recognize him because they were so focused on the negativity. A lot of times in life, when we focus on the negativity, we cannot see when God is working. God is always there. He's already promised he's never going to leave us, that he's never going to forsake us. He can rest assured that God is always working. He's always there for you. He's not against you. We just have to open our eyes and trust in him and realize that he is there. And we can know that he's there because he's told us that, that he will be there. Amen. So when Habakkuk learned what God was going to do, I'm sure he might have wished he would have never brought up the subject and questioned God. God told the prophet about the coming Chaldeans or the Babylonians and what they would do to Jerusalem and Israel in order to cleanse the people of idolatry. In Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 6 through 9, again in the New Living Translation, God tells Habakkuk, I am raising up the Babylonians, a cruel and violent people. They will march across the world and conquer other lands. They are notorious for their cruelty and do whatever they like. Their horses are swifter than cheetahs and fiercer than wolves at dusk. Their charioteers charge from far away. Like eagles, they swoop down to devour their prey. On they come, all bent on violence. Their hordes advance like a desert wind, sweeping captives ahead of them like sand. And you can see from both a historical and a theological perspective that this is an interesting story because God is using a pagan nation to destroy what was once a godly nation up until this time. And then God will deal harshly with those nations who oppressed and destroyed the very godly nation. So Habakkuk learned a very valuable lesson here. God does not always give us the answers that we want or that we expect. Why was it that Judah was dealt with God so harshly? Why was it that, that they were dealing with all of this judgment and the oppression and, and being taken over by one nation after another? It's because the people of Judah... The people of Jerusalem, they knew better than to flaunt their dismissal of God and his laws. They had turned their back on God. They had turned to idolatry. They had turned to worshiping other gods. And if we are not careful here at the United States, the same kind of oppression, the same kind of judgment can and will happen here because God is no respecter of persons. Every society in the history of this world that was founded on the word of God, when that nation turned their back on God, that nation literally ceases to exist. And I believe we are very close to the same thing happening here at the United States. Unless this nation repents and turns around, we are headed to destruction. I believe as long as there is a church of Jesus Christ that is still praying, still seeking the face of God, I believe we'll still have the divine favor of God. But I also believe that the moment the rapture of the church takes place, this church is out of here. No Christian left to pray in this in this nation and no one left to pray the judgment of God away. I believe this nation is going to see the wrath of God in a way such as never been met before in the history of this world. It will happen. It's happened everywhere around this world when a nation turns their back on God. In Habakkuk chapter 2, God writes his plan for redemption. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 4, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is, no, is not a pride in him, but the just shall live by faith. Think about that phrase, the just shall live by faith. It is by faith that we live. It's not by feelings. Feelings change from one day to the next. Somebody might walk in the sanctuary and say, oh, pastor, I feel the presence of God in this place. Well, just because they do doesn't mean someone else on the other side of the church feels the presence of God. They may have just come in and, and just had an argument with their family and their kids may have uh, backed the car into the garage and destroyed the garage door and everything's jammed up and they come in and they say, Pastor, don't you feel the presence of the Lord? Or they see someone else, don't you feel the presence of God? Ain't God good? And you just, yeah, 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 I understand. We've all had days like that. You know, life is daily. You never know what, what's going to happen. And, and I use... 
I use illustrations sometimes from my own experience because uh, our garage door has jammed up. We bought Alyssa a new car uh, a couple of months ago, and now she can't drive it because our garage door system broke, and we can't open the door, and it's all jammed up, and so she's driving her old car again until we can get... Uh, they're going to have to replace the whole system, I found out. So, you know... Life happens. Things happen in life. We just have to deal with it and keep on going and keep on breathing. And so it's by faith that we live. Thank God we can't base our relationship with Jesus Christ on how we feel. Because some days when you're dealing with the cares of day-to-day life, if you've had a rough day on the job, aren't you glad you don't have to worry about your feelings keeping you in tune with God, but you can rest assured that you know your name's written in heaven based upon what the word of God says, that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation, the old things are passed away, all things are become new, and we can trust in him, stand on his word, because his word will get us through. Yeah, we may go through some difficult times. That's part of life. God never promised he was going to save us from trouble. He never promised that we're going to have a good day every day of our life, because the children of Israel sure never had a good day every day of their life. The apostles of the early church never had good days every day, but God helped them and he strengthened them through every trial that they faced and through it all, it helped them grow stronger in the Lord and in the power of his might. You see, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Several hundred years after the ministry of Jesus Christ, this truth, this message of the gospel was lost in the church because the Catholic Church exchanged it for man-made religion. It was not found and renewed until Martin Luther's courageous declaration of the 99 Thesis that he pounded onto the Pope's door, and Martin Luther was a courageous Catholic monk who declared in the early 1500s, he declared publicly that we are not saved by buying an indulgence from the Catholic Church, but we're saved because the just shall live by faith. Church, we're saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. It's not by works. It's not by anything that we do to deserve salvation, but it's because of what Christ did on the cross of Calvary when he died and rose again to make salvation possible. That's where salvation comes from. Let's move on now to the book of Zephaniah. This prophet lived and ministered in Judah just prior to the Babylonian captivity. Zephaniah was the great-great-grandson of King Hezekiah. He is known perhaps as being the best known as the prophet of love. Now, there were two sides to true love. There was the bright side of love in which there's happiness and everyone gets along perfect and everyone loves each other and everyone's just having a good time. But then there's the dark side of love. Some also label this as tough love. This is the kind of love that is expressed when parents need to bring discipline to their children. It's the kind of love that is expressed when teaching children and adults, as the case may be, and family and friends to learn how to be responsible. And so this is what the book of Zephaniah is all about. It's about the dark side of love. Now, there is a pastor today of one of America's fastest growing and largest churches, And he's made the statement many times. I've heard him say from the pulpit, God never looks at what's wrong with your life. He looks at what's good. Now, I want to read to you from the book of Zephaniah, chapter 3, from the New Living Translation, and you can decide for yourself if you believe that God looks at what's wrong in people's lives and his response to what things, his response to the wrong things that people do. In Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 1 through 20, this is what the Lord tells Zephaniah. What sorrow awaits rebellious, polluted Jerusalem, the city of violence and crime? No one can tell it anything. It refuses all correction. 
It does not trust in the Lord or draw near to its God. Its leaders are like roaring lions hunting for their victims. Its judges are like ravenous wolves at evening time, who by dawn have no trace of their prey. Its prophets are arrogant liars seeking their own gain. Its priests defile the temple by disobeying God's instructions. But the Lord is still there in the city, and he does no wrong. Day by day, he hands down justice and he does not fail but the wicked know no shame I have wiped out many nations devastating their fortress walls and towers their streets are now deserted their cities lie in silent ruin there are no survivors none at all I thought surely they will have reverence for me now Surely they will listen to my warnings. Then I won't need to strike again, destroying their homes. But no, they get up early to continue their evil deeds. Therefore, be patient, says the Lord. Soon I will stand and accuse these evil nations. For I have decided to gather the kingdoms of the earth and pour out my fiercest anger and fury on them. All the earth will be devoured by the fire of my jealousy. Then I will purify the speech of all people so that everyone can worship the Lord together. My scattered people who live beyond the rivers of Ethiopia will come to present their offerings. On that day, you will no longer need to be ashamed, for you will no longer be rebels against me. I will remove all proud and arrogant people from among you. There will be no more haughtiness on my holy mountain. Those who are left will be the lowly and humble, for it is they who trust in the name of the Lord. The remnant of Israel will do no wrong. They will never tell lies or deceive one another. They will eat and sleep in safety, and no one will make them afraid. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord will remove his hand of judgment and will disperse the armies of your enemy. And the Lord himself, the King of Israel, will live among you. At last, your troubles will will be over, and you will never again fear disaster. On that day, the announcement to Jerusalem will be, cheer up, Zion. Don't be afraid, for the Lord your God is living among you. He is a mighty Savior. He will take delight in you with gladness. With his love, he will calm all your fears. He will rejoice over you with joyful songs. I will gather you who mourn for the appointed festivals. You will be disgraced no more, and I will deal severely with all who have oppressed you. I will save the weak and helpless ones. I will bring together those who were chased away. I will give glory and fame to my former exiles, wherever they have been mocked and shamed. On that day, I will gather you together and bring you home again. I will give you a good name, a name of distinction among all the nations of the earth as I restore your fortunes before their very eyes. I, the Lord, have spoken. When I read that text, it reminds me of the promise that God made in Deuteronomy that when you are obedient to the word of God, you're going to be blessed by God. But if you are disobedient to his word, you're going to experience the cursing of God. I understand that there are times that when we're living for God, that we do face difficult times. It's not the wrath of God. It's man's inhumanity to mankind. Kind. But I believe that on Judgment Day, when we stand before God, we're going to thank Him for every test. We're going to thank Him for every trial. For it was out of the trials and the and the things of day to day life that we were refined for His use and His kingdom, and to be prepared to spend eternity with Him. I want us to move on now to the book of Haggai. Somewhere shortly before the year 500 B.C., the Persian monarch Cyrus freed all of the political prisoners, including the Jewish people who had been conquered by the Babylonians and exiled from their homeland. When these exiled Jews returned to their war-ravaged land in and around Jerusalem, one of God's men who was powerfully influencing them was Haggai the prophet. He's also mentioned throughout the book of Ezra. 
And while having to rebuke the people every now and then on occasion, he also cheered them on and he encouraged them in their reconstruction of their country. It was Haggai's passion to reconstruct and to refurbish the temple in Jerusalem. In Haggai chapter 1 verse 8, he says, Go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. In chapter 1, verse 14, he says, And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatil, the governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. See, the things that the people of Israel, the, the, the people of the, the Jewish people, they were facing some interesting times. They had returned from exile where they had been treated humanely, although they were still prisoners. And as they returned back to Judah and come back into the city of Jerusalem, they were rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem and they were rebuilding homes for themselves. But yet at the same time, the temple was still in ruins. No one was really excited about rebuilding the temple. They were too tired. They were discouraged. They recognized that they could not rebuild anything that would resemble the former temple that was built by King Solomon. And so because of their discouragement, they sat back and did nothing. One Bible commentator writes that perhaps the people of Judah had been committed to death. The delegation had made a delegation, and that delegation delegated some other delegates. And to them, a committee was a group of people who individually could do nothing and who collectively would decide that nothing was going to be done. But here's the good news. God was not going to use committees to rebuild Judah. He used great individuals whose writings we treasure in the Word of God today. These are the prophets, the major prophets and the minor prophets. It was these men that God used to rebuild Jerusalem. I want us to move on now. We're going to spend some time in the book of Zechariah. Zechariah writes his prophetic message in the year 520 B.C. It was during a time when the Jewish people started drifting back to Jerusalem from Babylonian captivity. The first six chapters deal with ten visions that the prophet Zechariah has Seemingly, these visions were all in one night. So I want us to look briefly here at the ten visions of Zechariah. The first vision that he has is the riders under the myrtle tree. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 8, he says, I saw by night, and behold, a man riding upon a red horse. <coughs> and he stood among the myrtle trees that were in the bottom, and behind him were their red horses speckled and why? So who is this rider? I believe it to be none other than Jesus Christ himself because in verses 11 and 12, he's called the angel of the Lord. In the Old Testament times, every time the Bible talks about the angel of the Lord, this is a synonym in the Bible for a pre-incarnate version of Jesus Christ, such as what you see as the fourth man in the fire, the likeness of the Son of God, the angel of the Lord. Jesus was not yet manifested in the flesh. That didn't happen until Luke chapter 2 in the New Testament. And so in the Old Testament time, any time that you're seeing a reference to the Son of God, the Son of Man, the angel of the Lord, it is a reference to a pre-incarnate version of Jesus Christ. We need to understand that this message came 500 years before the birth of Jesus as a baby in Bethlehem. And we need to think of Jesus as appearing in the ruins of Jerusalem and mourning for what they have been through. In Zechariah chapter 1 verse 16, Therefore thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it, saith the Lord of hosts, and a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Jesus was declaring that better times were now going to come back to this region. The second vision of Zechariah is the vision of the four horns. This is in Zechariah chapter 1, verse 18 through 19. Then lifted I up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, What be these? And he answered me, 
These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. Now, this passage of Scripture defines itself, and I'm going to explain this here in just a moment as we talk about this next vision, the vision of the four smiths. In the King James Version, it calls them the four carpenters. In Zechariah chapter 1, verse 20 through 21, the Lord showed me four carpenters, or four smiths. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head, but these are come to fray them, to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah, to scatter it. So these carpenters, or blacksmiths, represent the nations that had brought about oppression against Israel. We're looking at the nations such as Babylon, uh, Medo-Persian, Greece, and the Roman Empire. So this is basically the same as we saw in Nebuchadnezzar's vision in Daniel chapter 2. The next vision, the fourth, the fourth vision, is the vision of the man with the measuring line. In Zechariah chapter 2, verse 1 through 5, I lifted up mine eyes again and looked, and behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Then said I, Whither goest thou? And he said unto me, To measure Jerusalem, to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him. And said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about and will be the glory and the midst of her. So who is it that's holding this measuring line here? I believe it's Jesus because God himself is the one who set the boundaries for Israel. This passage indicates to us that the Lord intended Jerusalem to be rebuilt. He prophesied that there was going to be multitudes of people living in the city of Jerusalem, which we certainly see today as Jerusalem is the largest city in that region. It is the capital of of Israel, and, and even the nations around the world now are recognizing it as the capital city. The next vision, the fifth vision, is about Joshua and Satan. In Zechariah chapter 3, verse 1 through 7, And he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to resist him. And the Lord said unto Satan, The Lord rebuke thee. O Satan, even the Lord that hath chosen Jerusalem, rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And say unto him, he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with change of raiment. And I said, Let them set a fair might upon his head. So they set a fair meter upon his head, and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by. And the, and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, If thou wilt walk in my ways, and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house, and shalt keep my courts, and I will give thee places to walk among these that stand by. Joshua served as a high priest among the remnant of Jewish people who returned from Babylonian captivity. Now keep in mind, this is not the same Joshua who led the Israelites into the promised land, but this is Joshua the high priest. In this particular vision, Zechariah sees the high priest appearing before our Lord himself, but he also sees Satan in the same vision. What was Satan doing there? He was resisting Joshua. That's what Satan does. He resists the people. He resists the the plan of God, but in the process, the Lord rebukes Satan even as he does today. The devil tries to come against the church, but Jesus has already said that he's going to build his church and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Satan cannot be victorious against the church of Jesus Christ. Amen? Isn't it strange how Joshua the priest stands before the Lord? The Bible tells us that he's dirty. 
He's wearing unclean clothes. But isn't that how we all stand before God? The Bible tells us that all of our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags before a just and holy God. The next vision that we see is the vision of the branch. In Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8 through 10. Hear now, O Joshua, the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee. For they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. For behold, the son that I have laid before Joshua upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. A lot of times in the word of God, the branch is usually a depiction of our Lord Jesus Christ, such as what we see in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1, where the Bible says, There shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This branch is also the stone of verse 9 that we just read a moment ago. This is speaking of Jesus himself. And Daniel chapter 2, verse 34 through 35, talks about the same stone. It says, Thou sawest till that stone was cut without hands, which smote the image upon his feet that were of iron and clay, and break them to pieces. This was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken to pieces together and became like the shaft of the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. Can you see how the word of God simply defines itself? All of the Word of God, every book of the Bible, as I mentioned to you this morning, it all revolves around the person and the work of Jesus Christ himself. The next vision that we see is the vision of the lampstand and the two olive trees. Zechariah chapter 4, verse 1 through 6, And the angel that talked with me came again and waked me as a man that is wakened out of his sleep and said unto me, What seest thou? And I said, I have looked, and behold, a candlestick, all of gold, with a bowl upon the top of it, and a seven lamps thereon, and the seven pipes to the seven lamps which are upon the top thereof, and two olive trees by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side thereof. So I answered and spake to the angel that talked with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel that talked with me answered and said unto me, Knowest thou not what these be? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel was the civil head of Jerusalem, while Joshua was the religious leader. The message to everyone, and, and one that has been a message in the assemblies of God since its beginning in 1914, was that all of our work, all of our ministries, all of our accomplishments, everything that we do was not because we were strong, it was not because we were brilliant or intelligent, but it was all because of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's why we boldly proclaim that it's not by might nor by power, but by His Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zerubbabel and Joshua are represented in this prophecy as the two olive trees. Now, this next vision is an interesting one. Someone was showing this to me the other day, and they had a misunderstanding of what it's talking about. The vision of the flying roll in Zechariah chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. Then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a flying roll. I want to stop right there for just a second. This is not talking about Lambert's Cafe in Ozark, Missouri, home of the hand-tossed rolls. If you look in the New Living Translation, the flying roll is transferred as a flying scroll. It's a roll of documents. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about this flying scroll. He said unto me, what seest thou? And I answered and said, I see a flying scroll. The the length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 
ten cubits. Then said he unto me, This is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For every one that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it. And every one that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. So this flying scroll represents the word of God. And the size of it, as pointed out in verse 2, indicates the vastness of God's word. It means that God's word covers everything. That there's nothing new that needs to be proclaimed. There's nothing new that needs to be revealed to the people of God because God's word is already discussed. His word has already settled it. Every message in tongues, every message of prophecy, every word of wisdom given through the inspiration of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, it will all be backed up 100% by the word of God. If there's any difference, then it's not true. If it's new, it's not true. And if it's true, it's certainly not new. Everything God needs us to know has already been written down in the word of God. Verse 3 suggests that this scroll was in two parts. This could be representing the Ten Commandments because the first four of the Ten Commandments is dealing with mankind's relationship to God. The last six commandments are dealing with mankind's responsibilities to humanity. No nation and no individual is any stronger for God than his or her knowledge of the word of God. Remember that the people of Israel had just returned from captivity in Babylon. They had been in captivity all of this time because of their idolatry. They had fallen into the lifestyle of idolatry because they had put God's word aside and had forgotten it. Church, there were assemblies of God churches all across this nation today that run buses for their church services, a lot of times on Wednesday nights. They bring many children to their church. They have great food for these kids. They play lots of games with these kids. They have many activities. But unless the word of God is being taught to these children, it's all a waste of time, and they will spend eternity in hell crying out, why did you not tell me the word of God? Church, listen, we have a responsibility to proclaim the gospel message to those who do not know it. They're not going to hear it at school. They're not going to hear it at home. They're not going to hear it anywhere else, but they better hear it here. They better hear it in Sunday school class. They're going to hear it when they walk through the doors of this church because it is our responsibility to do what God has called us to do to fulfill our part of the great commission of Jesus Christ. The next vision that we see is the vision of the woman with the epah, or also known as the basket. In Zechariah chapter 5, verse 5 through 11, Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, Lift up now thine eyes and see what this that goeth forth. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is an epah that goeth forth. And he said, Moreover, this is their resemblance through all the earth. And behold, there was lifted up a talent of lead, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the Ephah. And he said, This is wickedness. And he cast it into the midst of the Ephah, and he cast the weight of the lead upon the mouth thereof. Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings, for they had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the afar between the earth and the heaven. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, Whither do these bear the afar? And he said unto me, To build an house in the land of Shinar, and it shall be established and set there upon her own base." And a fall is a dry measure equal to about a bushel. It is symbolic of trade. What was one of the major sins Israel dealt with upon returning from captivity? This time it was not idolatry. Now it was materialism. God is telling Israel that even while he has blessed them, that they should not think of money as an indicator of his approval upon their life. We could camp here for quite a while and learn a deal more, but we've got to move on. I want us to move on to the vision of the four chariots. 
the 10th vision of Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 6, verse 1 through 5. And I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came four chariots out from between two mountains, and the mountains were mountains of brass. In the first chariot were red horses, and the second chariot black horses, and the third chariot white horses, and the fourth chariot grizzled and bay horses. Then I answered and said unto the angel that talked with me, What are these, my Lord? And the angel answered and said unto me, These are the four spirits of the heavens, which go forth from standing before the Lord of all the earth. These four spirits, or four angels of God, go forth through the world to deal with the sins of the nations. Most of the remaining chapters of Zechariah deal with God's concerns about the people of Israel. You see, Israel is always at the centerpiece of God's prophetic timetable. Everything that is concerning the end times has Israel at the very center. In other words, in the end times, you're looking at a world leader who leads the world in peace. Other nations that want to destroy Israel. Peace treaties and so forth that are going to be events in the end times that's going to take place. And all of it is going to center around the nation of Israel. I want us to move on now to Zechariah chapter 14, where he's talking about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 14, verse 1 through 9, he says, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and houses riffled, and the women ravished, and half of the city shall go forth into captivity, and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Then shall the Lord go forth and fight against those nations as when he fought in the day of battle, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount Mount of olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half of the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azal. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled from before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. And it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be one day which shall be known to the Lord, not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. And it shall be in that day that living waters shall go out from Jerusalem, half of them toward the former sea, half of them toward the hinder sea, in summer and in winter shall it be, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day there shall be one Lord and his name one. This passage, I believe, is dealing with the second coming of Jesus Christ. And I firmly believe that this is the order of events that are going to take place in the very near future. First of all, you're going to see the rapture of the church. For those who are raptured, we're going to experience the judgment seat of Christ. At that time, it will be determined, the rewards, and then we will receive the marriage supper of the Lamb. For those who are left behind at the rapture, they're going to experience the powers of the Antichrist, the seven years of tribulation. And then we will see the second coming of Jesus Christ. At this time, the Lord shall be king over all the earth. His name will be one, and he will reign forevermore. I want us to move on to our final book of the Old Testament, the book of Malachi. In this book, the Old Testament closes. God speaks his last and final message to his people for 400 years until another message is spoken. In just a few weeks, we're going to be talking about those 400 years. But the word Malachi indicates a messenger. This is God's last message to the Old Testament. The next messenger does not come onto the scene in the word of God until John the Baptist begins to preach 400 years later. It was a very dark and troubling time for the people of Israel. But in this short book, the prophet Malachi tells about God's love for Israel in chapter 1. 
And from that point forward into chapter 2, God reproves religious leaders for profaning his work. That doesn't, it's not just talking about swearing in the conventional sense, but he's talking about making the sacred nothing more than secular. Watering down the message, sugarcoating the message so it, it, it makes it more convenient for everyone. In chapter 3, Malachi indicates God's displeasure of people who commit religious sins. And then finally, in chapter 4, Malachi predicts the day of the Lord and a golden era for all of redeemed humanity. In chapter 4, the prophet deals with the sanctity of marriage and the sacred union between a husband and wife. I want to share with you Malachi chapter 2, verse 14 through 15. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and thy wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. And did not he make one? Yet he had the residue of the Spirit, and wherefore one, that he might seek a godly seed. Therefore take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. There are many good teachings throughout the book of Malachi, and, and one of the best illustrated messages and teachings I have ever found written on the subject of tithing is also found in Malachi chapter 3. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring ye all tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Church, I can tell you, from my own personal experience and in the ministry, that life is so much better when you live on the 90% and you give God the 10% than trying to make ends meet living on the total 100%. If we are taxed on our gross income, then why not tithe on your gross income? I've tried it. It made a difference. See, the tithing principle is a financial promise from God himself. When God makes a promise, he always does what he says. You see, we have a destination to reach. One day we're all going to stand before God. We're going to be given an account of our life. If you will continue in his word and be obedient to his word, God will keep his promise to you. And when we see him, we're going to hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant and we will live with him throughout all of eternity. Can we stand together across this sanctuary tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your promise in the word of God. Lord, that everything that you want for your children to know, you have already told us in your written word. And God, all we've got to do is just trust in you. Stand upon your word live by your word be obedient to your word and you're going to guide us you're going to direct us you're going to lead us in the pathway of righteousness for your namesake jesus father you know every need that's represented in this church family lord you see the needs of sickness you see the needs of the struggles and the pains that we're going through the cares of daily life you see the difficult challenges that many endure. And God, I pray that you would be a hedge of defense, a hedge of protection, a solid foundation in their life that they can stand upon. That when the trials and the persecutions of daily life come against them, that you will be their shield of defense. You will be their weapon of defense. That you will be their strong tower that they can run to. That you will be their refuge and shelter and the time of every storm. Father, we plead your blood upon our unsaved loved ones. God, that the convicting power of your spirit would reach into their life and bring a change, Lord, 
that only you can give. Father, I pray for unity in every family, unity in our church, unity in our schools, unity on the job, unity in every area of ministry, God. For Lord, as long as we stay in one mind and one accord, I believe we're going to see you continue to do great and mighty things. Lord, we cannot take credit for anything that's going on in this church. We see new people coming in each week. We see lives being changed. But God, it's all because of you. It's all because of your grace and your mercy. And Lord, we give you praise. And we bless your name. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. All across this sanctuary, can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? He is worthy. Thank you.